Quadros, and I am the chair of the Houston Bar Association's Alternative Dispute Resolution section. Today, our mediation uh, topic and presentation is called Guess What? Your Online Mediation May Not Be Confidential by Jeff. Jeff is a Los Angeles-based mediator, is ranked in Chambers USA 2020 as one of the country's top mediators. He handles a wide variety of business-to-business -business cases, including particularly intellectual property, insurance coverage, and professional liability cases. He is an honors graduate of Harvard Law School and a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. He is an elected member of the American Law Institute, and his views on mediation have been cited in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. I just wanted to share a special message for a special guest. Hello, this is Mayor Sylvester Turner. Please join me in welcoming my Harvard Law School classmate, Jeff Kickabin to Houston through the technology of the internet. Today, he will present to the Houston Bar Association on the topic of the confidentiality of online mediation. I am told that Jeff's articles on this subject have attracted national interest and raised important questions for every mediator and for every lawyer who represents clients in mediation. I am confident that you will benefit from his presentation this morning. Jeff, welcome to Houston. Thank you, Mayor Turner. Uh, thank you to the Houston Bar Association for welcoming me so warmly, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's a great privilege to uh, address you all. I also wanted to mention in the crowd is another one of my law school classmates, Dave Sharp, and Dave helped to arrange the greeting from Mayor Turner. Dave is just a great friend, one of my best friends. You couldn't want a better friend than David Sharp. So Dave, thanks to you too for welcoming me here to Houston. Now let's talk about how we practice in mediation, how it affects us as mediators, how certain aspects of confidentiality also affect litigators. I suspect there are some litigators on the line as well. And let's talk about some ways we can improve the way we practice. Last spring, we had a dramatic shift in the world of mediation as we had in our entire society. Everything went online. And I was soon after considering a mediation in which I would be the only person physically present in California. I live in Los Angeles. Every other participant would be in a different state sprinkled all across the country. And so I asked myself, which state's confidentiality or privilege law would apply to that mediation by operation of law? This question came to my mind particularly because I do not use a so-called mediation confidentiality agreement, and I have not used one for many, many years for reasons we will discuss in more detail a little later. So I started doing a little research into this legal issue and I found myself knee deep in the subject of conflicts of law. Now as a mediator, people give me briefs. There are hyperlinks in the briefs to all the cases and treatises I need to read. And frankly, my research skills are a little rusty. And I found myself in way over my head in this legal research. So I realized I needed some help and I called my friend, Professor Teresa Frisbee at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. And she recruited a wonderful law student to work with us, Tyler Codina. And Tyler did tremendous legal research and found, first thing he found was an incredible case called Larson versus Larson a 10th Circuit case from 2017. It was a family dispute in which two siblings were in litigation against a third sibling regarding the distribution of assets from their parents' estate. The case was pending in the United States District Court for the District of Wyoming. The parties got together for a mediation and they had their mediation in Colorado. Everybody was together in a conference facility in Denver. Colorado law is very strong, very protective of mediation confidentiality. The parties, all the Larsons, their lawyers, signed a confidentiality agreement among themselves, and they also specified that Colorado law applied. At the end of the mediation, they thought they had a deal, and they signed the term sheet. Then, wouldn't you know it, they could not agree on final documentation for the settlement. Specifically, there was a dispute as to whether one particular piece of property 
was within the scope of their proposed release. Two of the siblings, Arnie and his sister Arla, said yes, and their brother Charles said no. So Arnie and Arla moved to enforce the term sheet in Wyoming, where the litigation was pending. Now, Wyoming mediation confidentiality law is very different than Colorado's law. Wyoming law is not protective of mediation confidentiality at all. So it, back in Wyoming, Arnie and Arla sought the production of Charles' PowerPoint from the mediation. They claimed that the PowerPoint talked about the property in dispute, and proved that Charles was indeed negotiating over that one piece of disputed property, in addition to everything else. The magistrate judge in Wyoming, in considering this discovery request, noted that Wyoming's choice of law rules generally honor the choice of law agreements, such as the Larson's Mediation Confidentiality Agreement, unless, unless the magistrate judge noted that agreement offends the law, public policy, or general interest of Wyoming citizens. Now, this was a purely private dispute. It's hard to find any public policy or general welfare of the citizens consideration at work here because you have a family dispute over how children are going to divide up the assets in their parents' estate. Nonetheless, the magistrate judge found the condition satisfied that the agreement did, did offend the law, public policy, or general interests of Wyoming citizens and ordered production. This, I thought, was a, a remarkable finding. The Tenth Circuit, however, agreed with the magistrate judge and found that the magistrate judge did not abuse discretion when the magistrate judge disregarded Colorado law and also disregarded the party's confidentiality agreement. And all I can say is, wow, the parties were totally relying on the local law of where the mediation took place. They stipulated that law should apply, and the magistrate judge disregarded it and ordered production of materials from their confidential mediation. Now, this may not concern all of you in Houston that much, as it frankly does not concern all of us in California that much, because we ask ourselves, what is the likelihood that the confidentiality of your Texas mediation will be tested in Wyoming. Well, what if I were to tell you that the same thing could well happen, and in a sense did happen, when the confidentiality of Texas communications was tested in New York? And spoiler alert, Texas confidentiality law did not fare very well. The case is called People of the State of New York versus Price Waterhouse Coopers. It's an appellate division case cited by the Intermediate Appellate Court of New York in 2017. It was part of the New York Attorney General's climate change lawsuit against Exxon and others. The Attorney General of New York subpoenaed Exxon's file with PricewaterhouseCoopers, its accounting firm. The communications principally took place in Texas, where Exxon is headquartered. Texas, in Texas, you have an accountant-client privilege. It's Occupations Code, Section 901.457. New York does not have an accountant client privilege. Remarkably, the New York court disregarded the Texas accountant client privilege, disregarded the party's reliance on the Texas accountant client privilege, and applied the law of the forum, New York, rather than the law of where the communications took place, Texas refused to respect the Texas privilege and ordered production. Again, what can you say but wow? To understand what makes this particularly remarkable, we have to get into the weeds of conflicts of law a little bit. There are not one, but two restatements of conflicts of law. There's the 1934 restatement, the first restatement, and then in 1971, there was the second restatement of conflicts of law. The 1934 restatement, when it looked at these issues of evidentiary privilege and confidentiality, used what it called the territoriality test, the territoriality test. Under the territoriality test, a court applies its local conflict, uh, its local privilege or confidentiality law the law of the forum where the discovery is sought or where the trial is to take place, regardless of where the communications took place or the expectations of the parties based on where the communications took place. Now, as you can imagine, this rule was widely criticized. 
It creates a tremendous lack of predictability. It encourages foreign shopping and so forth. So in 1971, the American Law Institute approved the second restatement of conflicts of laws and replaced the territoriality test with the most significant relationship test. Under the most significant relationship test, courts are supposed to apply the privilege or confidentiality law of the state with the most significant relationship to the communications at issue. Generally, that will be the state where the communications took place, because presumably the parties are relying on that privilege or confidentiality law when they are communicating. Since 1971, these kinds of issues have come up frequently in New York courts, and plenty of New York courts have applied the most significant relationship test and apply the privilege law of the state where the communications took place. But there is this other line of cases of which PricewaterhouseCoopers is a part, which go back to the territoriality test. Indeed, there's only one case since PricewaterhouseCoopers in 19, uh, 2017 which cites it, and that case is called AMBAC, A-M-B-A-C Assurance Corp Corporation versus Nomura Credit. That's an appellate division case from the year 2019. That was a sophisticated financial case, kind you often find in the state of New York. Nomura sought documents generated as part of the Wisconsin Insurance Commissioner's regulation of AMBAC. The Wisconsin legislature created a privilege, had created a privilege for those documents. The Wisconsin legislature found that the privilege was necessary for this part of the Wisconsin government, the insurance commissioner's office, to do its job. So in that case, the New York court honored the Wisconsin privilege and distinguished PricewaterhouseCooper and would not order production of the documents, but only as a matter of interstate comity because the New York Appellate Division held honoring the, the Wisconsin privilege was necessary to allow the government of another state to function as intended. So if you find yourself in a New York court that follows the PricewaterhouseCoopers territoriality test, that's an awfully big challenge, an awfully high bar to meet. And you might well find the New York courts disregarding your Texas privilege. Now, just as let's talk about how this applies to confidentiality of mediation, because just as New York does not have an accountant client privilege, it has almost no statutory protection for mediation, confidentiality, or privilege either. New York has civil practice law and rules section 4547, which is the analog of federal rule of evidence 408. And that's a very minimal protection for privilege or confidentiality. Under those statutes, offers and demands are inadmissible solely to prove the li liability or absence of liability for the claim being negotiated. And settlement negotiations are admissible for other purposes. It's like the hearsay ban. Hearsay is inadmissible to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but it can be admissible for other purposes. And clever lawyers often figure out another purpose and get that hearsay testimony admitted. Now, Texas has greater statutory protection for the confidentiality of mediations. It's uh, section 154.053C of your rules. And again, I'm not exactly a legal eagle on research anymore, and I'll be interested to hear your comments on all of this. But it seems to me that that statute is not that robust, to be honest because of cases where courts find judicially implied exceptions to what appears to be an absolute protection for the confidentiality of mediation communications. The most notable case that I found is Avery versus Bank of America, 72 Southwest 3rd, 779 from 2002, which seems to import much of the analysis of Rule 408, under which confidentiality protection is quite minimal. Still, it does look like the protection that you get in Texas is greater than the protection that New York affords for mediation communications. So if the confidentiality of a Texas mediation is tested in a New York court or any other court of a state which follows the first restatement territoriality approach, and there still are a few that follow that approach, all I can tell you is good luck. And let me add that even in a court that applies the most significant relationship test, 
the world has become much more complicated in the age of online mediation. Because remember, under the most significant relationship test, the court is supposed to apply the law of the state where the communication took place. In Larson, it was pretty easy to tell where the communications took place. Everybody was sitting in a conference room in Denver, Colorado. In, in uh, People's State of New York versus Pricewaterhouse Coopers, most of the communications between Exxon and its uh, auditor, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, took place in Texas. But in online mediations, when people are in different states, where does the communication take place? It's a, a, a different sort of question. And remember, whatever decision a court makes will be reviewed under a very generous abuse of discretion standard. So my sense is that the odds are that if you give courts much of a choice in terms of which state's mediation privilege or confidentiality law to apply, a court is likely to choose the law of whatever state gives it the greatest ability to get its hands on the evidence. That's not such a bad thing in all cases, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, but it certainly reduces the, uh, the expectation of confidentiality and the predictability of confidentiality in online mediations, because you never know where your confidentiality of your seemingly local mediation will take place. And it's also much harder to say that any mediation is really local anymore. So if the territoriality test might beat you, if conflicts of law analysis might beat you in trying to preserve the confidentiality of your mediation, what about private confidentiality agreements? Do they fare any better in New York than they do in Wyoming under Larson versus Larson and as might be applied to your mediation? I think the answer is, Maybe not. And the leading case here is called Hausinger versus Hausinger. It's a divorce action from New York, and it happened about 12, 13 years ago. The Hausingers had a mediation as part of their divorce. They reached the settlement, but Mrs. Hausinger got seller's remorse. She applied to the court to set aside the marital settlement agreement as unfair, and she subpoenaed the mediator to testify as to what happened in their New York mediation. The mediator objected. He invoked the party's mediation confidentiality agreement, which was one of these seemingly airtight, omnibus, universal confidentiality agreements. The appellate division in New York in 2007 disregarded that confidentiality agreement and affirmed a trial court order which had ordered the mediator to testify. Again, the review was under the very generous abuse of discretion standard. This created quite a controversy in the New York mediation community. The Uniform Mediation Act was introduced as legislation in the New York legislature, but not enacted. Remember, all they have is that civil practice law and rule, which is uh, the analog of Federal Rule 408. Then the New York Court of Appeal, the highest court in New York, decided the case and seemingly bailed out mediation confidentiality under private confidentiality agreements, but I don't think so. Because what the New York Court of Appeal found out of nowhere was that Mr. Hausinger had actually, in fact, waived the protections of the confidentiality agreement and figured, well, there's no problem allowing the mediator to testify if both Mr. and Mrs. Hausinger waived the confidentiality agreement and thought that the testimony was okay. But interestingly, the New York Court of Appeal did not disapprove of or even mention what the appellate division had done when it found that it was not an abuse of discretion for the trial court to disregard the party's confidentiality agreement and order the mediator to testify. So the appellate division decision in Housinger just kind of hangs out there. It looks like it's not disapproved. The reasoning of it is not really disapproved by the Court of Appeal. So it looks to me like the law of New York is that it is not an abuse of discretion for a trial court to disregard a mediation confidentiality agreement. So if the confidentiality of your Texas mediation or what you think is a Texas mediation is tested in New York and presumably in certain other states as well, your private confidentiality agreement may not help you preserve the confidentiality of your mediation either. Let me say that as a policy matter, I'm not sure that this is really such a bad result. Remember, 
courts are involved in a search for truth. And we want people to have confidence in our courts. We want people to believe that courts get things right. That's why we have the traditional rule of evidence, which is applicable everywhere, really. And in Texas, I believe it's in your rule of evidence 402, the basic rule of evidence that all relevant evidence is admissible. All relevant evidence is admissible. And the reason that we want all relevant evidence to be admissible is because we want to maximize the chance that courts are actually making correct decisions. Every assertion of privilege keeps relevant evidence away from a court, away from a trier of fact. So we have what's called the traditional Wigmore view of evidence from Professor Wigmore's evidence treatise, that privileges are to be construed narrowly and not to be extended beyond the reason for their existence. Because every time a privilege is successfully asserted, you deprive a court of relevant evidence and in a sense frustrate the search for truth, which ultimately gives people confidence in the operation of judicial systems. There's a strong reason to believe that there's no real evidence that we need anything much more than federal rule uh, 408, that we need anything, we, no evidence that we really need the enhanced protections of your Texas mediation confidentiality statute to get cases settled and to get mediations done. And I know that's a provocative statement to mediators, perhaps not so provocative to the litigators who are listening. There, you might look, for example, at a case called INRE MSPG, which is a federal circuit case, federal case from the year 2012. In that case, the parties urged the federal circuit to adopt a novel settlement negotiation privilege, which would go beyond federal rule of evidence 408 in shielding settlement communications, or as we're discussing the mediation communications from disclosure. The federal circuit brushed that suggestion aside with the back of its hand, barely even took it seriously, saying that people have been settling cases for generations without any such privilege, and that there's no need to hamper the search for truth by adopting one now. Let's also consider the real world experience of New York and its adjacent states to see whether people really care about mediation confidentiality the way many of us mediators think people do. New York, you recall, has almost no statutory protection for mediation confidentiality. All they have is the analog of Rule 408 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. New Jersey, by contrast, has the Uniform Mediation Act which is a much more robust protection of the confidentiality of mediation. Now, if mediation confidentiality were that important to people, you would think those bright New Yorkers would engage in a kind of mediation tourism and go across the Hudson River to mediate their cases, but they don't. There is no evidence of a mediation tourism industry in New Jersey. And what is the best indicator of that? Go to the JAMS website. If you go to the JAMS website, you'll see that JAMS has a huge office in New York City. I've been there. It's a beautiful office on 8th Avenue, right in the New York Times building. But JAMS does not have any office in the state of New Jersey. JAMS is a, a profit-maximizing organization in the private economy. And you would think that if there was money to be made in mediation tourism by getting New Yorkers to come to New Jersey, JAMS would have an office, have an office there. But they don't. The only conclusion that I can draw is that New Yorkers really don't care that much. People in the real world don't really care about mediation confidentiality the way many of us mediators think that people do. Now, notably, New Yorkers do respond well to other New Jersey laws, which are designed to draw them across the Hudson, most notably sales tax. Jersey City, New Jersey, has long had a 3.8% sales tax, and of course, sales tax in the state of New York and in Manhattan in particular is much higher. I think it's nine point something percent. And Jersey City has long made that sales tax the bedrock of its economy. They get a lot of commerce. A lot of people do come across the river to buy things in Jersey City at that lower sales tax rate. So New Yorkers do respond when it makes a difference. Now, let's take a look, a closer look at our mediation confidentiality agreements and get into material that is frankly a little more provocative. You've signed them as mediators, you've probably proffered them to people, selected them for people. 
and they seemingly make airtight absolute promises of the confidentiality of mediation. Nothing said or done in this mediation shall be subject to discovery or introduced in any evidence in any future proceeding between these parties or anybody else, no matter what jurisdiction, whether it's in Texas, the Marvel superhero universe, the DC universe, or any place else. Well, our mediation agreements may not go quite that far, but many mediators try to make them as absolutely airtight as possible. Here's the problem with those, both for litigators and for mediators. That promise of confidentiality is not a promise that you have the power to keep. It's a promise that will be kept or not kept by some store, some court, in who knows what jurisdiction, who knows when at the f in the future, when what happens in your mediation becomes relevant to some later judicial proceeding. And if you give it enough time and give it enough cases, it will happen. Somebody else will be as surprised as Charles Larson was when the Tenth Circuit ruled in Larson versus Larson that notwithstanding the law and the contract that he thought protected him, he was forced to disclose matters that, from the mediation. Somebody else will be as surprised as Mr. Housinger initially was in New York before somebody told him that he had in fact waived the confidentiality agreement. Give it enough time and somebody else is going to be just as surprised. Why do I believe that so strongly? I analogize it to what has happened in the world of arbitration. When Dave Sharp and Mayor Turner and uh, I graduated from law school in 1980, you almost never saw an appellate decision regarding arbitration. They were few and far between. As the years went on, the numbers increased, the number of cases involving arbitration increased as the ubiquity and use of arbitration increased in society. And I think that the same thing is going to happen with mediation. I think it inevitable that as time goes on, and mediation becomes more widely accepted, more popular, that satellite litigation growing out of our mediations will grow more common, just as it has happened in the world of arbitration. So what will happen to us as mediators and to litigators when some court in the future bites somebody and orders them to disclose what they thought was confidential from a mediation. Well, I think there's going to be claims and I think there may be liability. The claim will be that we as mediators or you as litigators induced or allowed your clients to be more candid than they otherwise would have been and it came back to bite them. The claim will be that there was a negligent misrepresentation. And after you've heard this presentation, the claim may be may not be that it's a negligent misrepresentation. And there will be claims as uh, of ordinary negligence as well. Those claims will be certainly be made against the lawyers who represented the clients and allowed them to sign those confidentiality agreements, which courts later uh, later unraveled. And I think for mediators, it is no better for us. I think that when it happens, we will be sued too either directly by the clients whose expectations of confidentiality were betrayed, or we'll find ourselves subject to contribution and indemnification claims against us by the lawyers who were initially sued by their client. Now, mediators, the claims against us will be for misrepresentations, mediator malpractice, and there will also be claims against us for legal malpractice. Because after all, generally speaking, it's we as mediators who furnish the confidentiality agreements to the participants. And furnishing the mediation agreement is law practice. The American Bar Association has a task force on the model definition of the practice of law. And that task force has found that, quote, selecting, drafting, or completing legal documents is the practice of law. And even so, even if all we're doing is selecting the legal documents for the parties to sign, that is law practice. There's potential ethical issues as well. American Bar Association Model Rule 7.1, Comment 2, says that we cannot guarantee outcomes to our clients, that that is considered to be misleading the client. But through these mediation confidentiality agreements, is that not exactly what we have done? Have we not promised them? that no court in the future 
will ever breach or uh, undo their confidentiality agreement. So there's an ethical issue there too. And while I don't think that the disciplinary authorities in any of our states will be racing to disbar us or discipline us for this, that's not really the point. The point is that we should always be striving to practice at the highest levels of ethics possible. We have to advise our clients honestly. While it's highly unlikely that a court in a future situation will undo your mediation confidentiality promises, it could happen. And so we have to behave accordingly in terms of how we as mediators talk about confidentiality to participants and how the litigators on viewing this webinar advise their clients as to just how candid they should and should not be in mediation and why. The question arises, will this hamper mediation? Will this hamper the effectiveness of mediation or people's willingness to participate in mediation? My answer to that is no. And again, I look to the real world example of what happens in New York. Lots of mediation takes place in New York where all lawyers presumably know New York law and understand that the confidentiality of their mediation, both statutory and contractual, is minimal. Now, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that I have not used so-called mediation confidentiality agreements for many years. I wanna pursue why I do that, and I wanna commend the approach to you for the reasons that I'm going to explain. For one thing, in Texas, it may cause your clients to forfeit substantive legal rights. Your legislature provided, for example, in section 154.073, that in the case of a legal requirement for disclosure of confidential mediation communications, courts are to ask whether the facts, circumstances, and context require disclosure or rather warrant a protective order. So there are some circumstances, it would seem, even under the plain meaning of the statute, where courts are supposed to engage in a balancing test and allow people to discover or introduce an evidence, uh, evidence of what hap has happened at a mediation. So it's not hard to argue. And again, my legal research skills are a little rusty, and I'd be interested in hearing from people on the call. To me, it seems not difficult to argue that a subpoena is a legal requirement for disclosure. A subpoena, after all, is technically a court order requiring someone to produce testimony or documents. And courts, in their search for truth, may well apply the balancing test and find that the circumstances and context, in fact, require disclosure. An airtight universal omnibus confidentiality agreement may conflict with this. So the question for you, if you are a, uh, a litigator, is in entering into an airtight mediation confidentiality agreement, do you really intend to forfeit rights that the legislature gave your client under some circumstances to obtain relevant evidence from mediation? And for the mediators, the question is, do you really intend to condition your service on people's willingness to forfeit rights which the legislature gave them. And making the question more complicated for mediators, do you intend to condition your service on people's willingness to forfeit rights without telling them that that's what you're doing? Because I don't know a single mediator who describes the effect of a mediation confidentiality agreement on the, on the rights to, pr to procure evidence which the law of Texas or any other state may give them. And there have been cases where these confidentiality agreements have come back to bite people. The most notorious case in which it's happened is called Facebook versus Connect You. It's a Ninth Circuit case from 2011, and it's part of the legal battle between Mark Zuckerberg and the Winklevoss twins. And we all know about this from the wonderful movie, The Social Network. You may recall, that the twins claim that Mark Zuckerberg defrauded them in connection with Zuckerberg's acquisition of their Facebook share. The twins, uh, they had a mediation and they settled the case. Then the twins claimed that Zuckerberg defrauded them again during the mediation. And the twins tried to rescind the mediated settlement agreement based on that fraud. The Ninth Circuit held that the twins could not use the mediation uh, communications, the, uh, the allegedly fraudulent communications from Zuckerberg during the mediation 
to prove the fraud and get the mediated settlement agreement rescinded. The Ninth Circuit reasoned that under Rule 408, under rights that Congress presumably wanted the Winklevoss twins to have, they ordinarily would have been able to use evidence from the mediation to show fraud. That's not to show the strength or weakness of the claim being mediated, but rather to show something else. So Rule 408 ordinarily would have allowed that. But the Ninth Circuit reasoned, the Winklevoss twins signed a confidentiality agreement, one of these airtight confidentiality agreements before the mediation, and the court held that the twins forfeited the right to use the evidence for this collateral purpose, which Rule 408 otherwise would have preserved for them rights which Congress wanted them to have. So for the mediator who furnished that confidentiality agreement and for the lawyers for the Winklevoss twins who asked them to sign that confidentiality agreement, I think they dodged a malpractice bullet. I think that there's an important query here. Are you risking malpractice by having your clients waive these rights when you sign one of these universal confidentiality agreements? So again, Query, what impact are you having on your client's rights? Is this something that you really want to sign reflexively in every case? There's another reason, though, that I don't use confidentiality agreements and why I would ask you as a call to action mediators not to use this provision in a confidentiality agreement and litigators never to sign off on them. And that is this phrase, which appears in so many so-called confidentiality agreements. It's the prospective waiver of liability. The mediator shall have no liability for any act or omission in connection with this mediation. The mediator shall have no liability for any act or omission in connection with this mediation. It's a prospective waiver of liability. And I cannot express my views on this strongly enough. It is a cowardly act. It is immoral. I am asking every lawyer in this web Webinar, never sign one of those again in favor of a mediator. And I'm asking every mediator, strike it from your mediation agreement. What are you in substance saying, mediators, when you ask someone to sign a prospective waiver of liability? You're in essence saying this, in the unlikely event that I commit malpractice that causes you financial damage, and even though I carry malpractice insurance, so that you can be compensated without causing me to suffer financial ruin, it is personally important to me that you do not receive that compensation. Think about it. As lawyers, if you were to put a prospective waiver of liability in your engagement letter with your client, you could lose your license. It's right in the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Professional Conduct, Rule 1.08 per NG. Now, this prospective waiver of liability has nothing to do with confidentiality but many mediators will tuck it into a confidentiality agreement and hope that nobody pays attention. Mediators, I believe that we demean ourselves when we do that. We are announcing to the world that we are lowering our ethical standards when we mediate. We are not practicing at the same level of ethics that we do when we practice as lawyers. And you, as litigating lawyers listening to this webinar, are accepting a mediator who is practicing at a lower ethical standard than your own. Litigating lawyers, you are accepting mediation services at a lower level of confidence, a lower level of competence. A mediator who tries to be exempt from the tort system loses one motivation to perform services competently. Remember, the tort system is designed for many purposes. Of course, it compensates victims in particular cases. In addition, it sets out rules of conduct and expectations to ensure that people perform their services competently and carefully. And that's because we know there are tort consequences that we will suffer if we don't perform competently. It's an inducement to perform at a higher level of skill. If you remove an incentive to competent performance by mediators, the quality of service you receive can only suffer. It also does not say very much about a mediator's confidence in their own ability to perform services competently for you. So lawyers, let me ask you, why should you receive services from mediators at lower standards of ethics and quality than the services you yourselves render to your own clients. And as mediators, we should want to inspire confidence in the quality of our work, 
we should send the message that we stand behind the quality of our work 110% and that we it's personally important to us that people be compensated and treated fairly in the unlikely event that something goes wrong. A prospective waiver of liability can only lessen people's confidence in us and ultimately lessen people's willingness to use our services. Compare it to other professions. Let's say you went into a dentist's office and let's say the dentist with the drill in hand said to you, you know, before I put this uh, this drill inside your skull, Mr. Kitchhaven, uh, I'd like you to sign this prospective waiver of liability saying that I have no liability for any act or omission that may happen in connection with this dental procedure. I don't know about you, but I'd be out of that dentist chair just as fast as I could and I'd be looking for a professional who stood behind the quality of their service and did not look to duck that responsibility. So here's my call to action. Counsel your clients honestly about the fact that nobody can promise absolute confidentiality in a mediation. Counsel your clients honestly and act accordingly and strike those confidentiality promises from mediation confidentiality agreements if you're a litigating lawyer and a mediator presents one to you. As we all know, the supply of mediation services far outstrips demand, and I don't think any mediator will be so haughty as to try to insist on a prospective waiver of liability as a condition of providing services. And lawyers never ever sign, up, sign off on one of those prospective waivers. In our great country, nobody is above the law. And then approach the subject of mediation confidentiality and mediation confidentiality agreements thoughtfully rather than reflexively. Yes, there are some situations where you may want to have confidentiality agreements, for example, to limit the extent to which people talk to the press about what happens in your mediation. And there are controversial provisions which go into settlement agreements, whether mediated or not, confidentiality agreements in products liability cases and sexual harassment cases and in other areas where confidentiality agreements are controversial and are approached thoughtfully and not reflexively. So think about the extent of confidentiality that you really need for your mediation. Think about the extent of confidentiality that the law really permits for your mediation and give your clients the kind of thoughtful and deliberative service that they deserve. Shannon, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank Mayor Turner and everybody in the Houston Bar Association, my dear friend and law school classmate, Dave Sharp. I see your picture in the upper right-hand uh, Corner there, happy birthday to Victoria, your uh, charming bride and also a law school classmate of ours. Happy birthday to Vicki. And um, if there are any questions that we don't have time to get to today, I wanna give everybody my contact information because if you have a question, you deserve an answer. My email is uh, my initials, jk at my name, jeffkitchhaven.com. And my cell phone number is area code 310-721. 5785. Please feel welcome to email at any time. Please feel welcome to call at any time, but please remember I'm in a different time zone than you are. Thank you very much. Shannon, back to you. So Jeff, uh, one, one question for you as well that came, came across the wires for me was um, one of the key, I think, drivers for Texas confidentiality in mediations was so that the mediator could help the party work through some of those, some of those issues, to particularly to measure risk, to, to have a frank discussion about ma measuring risk, and that's sort of part of the reality testing of the client or the party. And the concern about limiting confidentiality in that sense is then then the mediator is now privy to some some particular particular information that is not otherwise subject to discovery, particularly about their their willingness to say compromise and things of that nature. Um, with with these these waivers and disclosures of what the going ons of mediation, what can mediators do then to you know encourage that frank conversation, but at the same time um, make the party revealing those confidences feel secure that that suddenly does not become public information? Shannon, I think this is a bunch of urban legend. I just don't believe it at all. 
And the reason that I don't believe it is because of the real world experience of what goes on in New York, where with virtually no statutory protection for mediation confidentiality and contractual protection for mediation confidentiality, which courts can disregard more or less at will, they have plenty of mediation and they settle plenty of cases through mediation in the state of New York. If it were that important, then you would see people either not mediating in New York, taking their mediations to New Jersey or doing something else. But that just does not happen. I think that all of this, this mantra, I think that's all it is. It's an incantation. Confidentiality is necessary to effective mediation. Confidentiality is necessary to effective mediation. If that were true, there'd be no evidence. Uh, there'd be no mediation in New York. Yet there is. So I think we've uh, we've just talked ourselves into it. Fair I enough. also see I also see Jim Alfini <laughs> on the line. And Jim is a dear friend and a colleague of many years standing from our our days together on the council of the ABA section of dispute resolution and. Uh, Jim, it's uh, wonderful to see you. Uh, uh, hope you're hope you're healthy and upbeat. Um, I just wanted to just make an announcement as well for uh, for any of you that had missed uh, the earlier part of the presentation. We have recorded this. It will be put up on the HBA's website in about a week uh, once we just get the audio and the video edited accordingly. And I wanted to also remind everyone that as far as uh, CLE information is, it, the Texas CLE course number is one seven four. 102865. That's 174 102865. And I put that up in the chat. Um, and Jeff, could you, uh, I'm going to, uh, could you give us your, uh, your email address one more time? And I'm going to type it in the chat as well. Yeah, it's my initials, JK, at my name, jeffkitchaven.com. All right. And I put that in the chat for everyone. Um, I don't believe we have any more questions. Jeff, thank you so much. I know it's now it's now 6.30 in the morning there. You started this at 5.30 <laughs> in the morning. So thank you for your dedication to the practice of, of mediation um, because uh, yeah, that, nothing says that more than waking up at four something in the morning to get ready for this. So um, we appreciate you certainly. Again, everyone, this is, this is me. This presentation, Jeff's presentation is recorded. We will be putting it up shortly. Let me say a final thank you to, to you. Thank you to the Houston Bar Association for welcoming me uh, so warmly. Thanks to Mayor Turner for his uh, wonderful greeting that he offered. Thanks to uh, Dave Sharp for being a great friend over all these years and uh, helping to arrange with Mayor Turner his greeting. And it's uh, Jim Alfini. It's great to see you. I feel very well. I feel very welcome by all of you in, in Houston and the great state of Texas. And I hope to see you all again very soon. All Thank right. you.